Welcome to the Pharma Sales and... Hello, ladies and gentlemen. And today is again me, Stefan. And we have today amazing Josephine Klein Dahlgren, who is mid management sustainability sales negotiation leader at Frost Pharma. Personally, I went through Josephine's profile and I saw a lot of like leadership and empowerment skills and she can be like a great guide. So I was really excited to get her as a guest on the podcast. We also don't have a lot of female leadership on the podcast. So I was really glad to get her here. Welcome to the scene. Thank you so much, Stefan, for inviting me to your podcast. And I'm looking forward to our conversation. Amazing. Cool. Just to start with, like, I can see that you are sort of a big leader in your company, right? In Frost Pharma. Is that correct? Well, we are quite a small company. I'm, I'm currently the head of tender management at Frost Pharma. We prim mm -hmm. so I primarily work with the bid management. And I have been with the company for six years now. I was actually the first one they hired as being, when being a startup. And when I started, we had the turnover of under 2 million euros. And today we are at 14 million. So you have gained a lot of additional responsibilities over the year and learned large amounts about the industry and mm -hmm. also had a lot of fun with the amazing colleagues. And okay. as but you mentioned, yeah, additionally, I am passionate about being a mentor and I am a board member also and the speakers. So I do a lot of talks about leadership, strategy, stakeholder relationship building. I love to inspire and empower peers within the industry. Awesome. As you guys transition, like, let's talk about your company. As you guys transition from a small startup, like under 2 million, now you're guys making 40 million on sale. So obviously... You've done like a big journey and, you know, we discussed it before. You are sort of like a scientist who would become a business leader, right? And you're like in sales. So like, that's, like, that's even harder, I would say. So you've done like an amazing transformational journey. Can you start, can you talk about like maybe the checkpoints or the challenges you had out there and that you encountered? I lost you a bit, but you mentioned checkpoints and challenges. Yes. So your challenges and the checkpoints you had that you encountered, like, you know, the most interesting stories you had throughout the journey you've, you've done with Frost Farm. Yes. And when it comes to that transition also from science going into business, more industry-wide than for Frost Farm, I think <laughs> people in Frost Farm are very not at all judgmental. So that's very lovely. But overall for the industry, it's when having a background in science, People often think that you don't know business and mm. you just have to prove them wrong, say. And I think quite commonly, always people have misconceptions and or have an image of what a person would be or do. So it's just to, no matter what background you have, so just don't focus on what people say or, you know, what you, input you get. Just know that you are the one that knows you best and know what you can provide best and just... Don't have, don't engage in those kind of dialogues, I'd say, about prejudice. Just show what you can do and then they will stop, you know, have the wrong image of you. Mm, okay, cool. So I guess you encountered a lot of prejudice, like, you know, as a female leader, someone who comes from science and actually I saw like that you were reading a lot of like business books, right? So, and I'm reading a lot as, as well, right? So we discussed about <laughs> extreme ownership, we discussed mm -hmm. the, the battle for your mind, it's a book about positioning. And um, how did those books like help you shape your business sort of a leader personality? It's a great question. So actually, when I chose to go and study science, I knew I wanted to go into the farm industry because then you feel that like you're helping people. And I still enjoy the business. At the same time as I, I enjoy science, I really love the business part of work. And I figured I didn't want to study my whole life. So I didn't want to take, you know, a master's in economics as well as a master in, in science, uh, as I have in biomedicine. But so I figured I can't do, you know, research by myself at home. But what I can do is, of course, you when you study by yourself, you don't get the as great an education as if you go to a, a top economic school, clearly. But you can attain a lot of that information by yourself, just reading and speaking with people. And so that's why I have done a lot of reading outside of work and school to get that insights, to get a better insight in the, into the business world. Yeah, you, you know what they say, that university is just the beginning where you start learning. You, even school is just the beginning where you start learning. You, you learn way more, you know, after you graduate mm -hmm. school or university, right? So like, if you think that 
studying and learning yes. will stop there at the university, then you're very wrong, right? So your, your life will be oh, the teacher. That's so true. Yes, definitely. I think primarily when you go to school, any university, you learn how to learn, I would say, like how to attain information. Because anyways, if you go to university, then five years later, a lot of it is not relevant at all. Thinking of tech now or how the industry works in, of course, some things are going to stay the same, but a lot of things are going to change. And so anyways, that education will not be, the things you've learned will not be relevant, but you still know how to learn and attain uh, new information. Mm, that's for sure. Like you can tell us more about this because, you know, you transition through like from one type of person to another type of person. But I have a question though. Are you more of an introvert or an extrovert, you think? I am more of an extrovert, but I know sometimes people believe I'm an introvert because I really choose my battles, let's say. So you basically focus on, you know, like you focus on the parts where the talks that make sense, right? You debate where it makes sense to debate, right? So you don't yes. mingle around. Okay. Yeah, because I assume <laughs> if, you, if you take a negotiation course, like they tell you like where you should debate and where you should not debate, right? <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> correct. And uh, always, uh, if you, you know, you fight every battle, people don't really listen, I would think. And, uh, but if you fight the ones that are important to you, I mean, when it comes to business, if that's what we're talking about now, then uh, you have a better shot of getting the important things moving forward where you believe these are important. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Okay. So I was, I was thinking because it's, we still talk about like sales a lot, business empowerment. So I would like to ask you like, so you guys have grown from a small into a big organization and also you've grown as a person inside the company, you've grown also personally and career wise, right? So I was wondering, do you have like a go-to, what are the like the go-to secrets when it comes to turning like just simple people into successful teams? And since you work in sales, what's your like go-to strategy or like what's your way to about this? One thing that I've really learned and I didn't think that way like five years ago or say actually before COVID is that you really have to share, you have to share about yourself with your colleagues and that you can, you can take that. In Sweden, we have a lot of fika, <laughs> fika breaks, like coffee breaks. And you need to do that in order to get better teams because you get better connection with your colleagues. And that really, when you get that you know, tighter relationship in working, you also want to do more for your colleagues and you work more, you work better together. And, but before COVID, I was so focused on, like, I really want to do a good job. I have, you know, you always have your list of what you should, things you should do. And I was like, no, you go take that coffee. I'm not interested really. That's not what I said, but that's how I felt that I'm, I'm here to work. I want to do my best and don't focus on the, the people basically. But that's, it's say, <laughs> not optimal if you want to have people with you and you know, move your project forward being, and that doesn't matter if you're a manager or an informal like project leader, you still need to give something of yourself if you want people to really engage in the project that you're running at that time. Mm -hmm. So basically you need to show your human self, right? You gotta, you gotta show that you are not like a leader who's like in Oh, I'm like so staying on a pedestal. Nobody can touch me, right? And like, I don't have feelings and you just guys mm. just follow orders, right? So you have to show vulnerability. Is that maybe what you're saying as well? Openness, vulnerability? Yes, that's definitely. Yes, that's definitely true. It's not always what you want to do, but it will help you. Guaranteed. Guaranteed. It will help you. Okay. Mm. <laughs> Actually. No, but it's quite interesting when you look at yourself, at least when I'm looking at myself and I have people that I admire and I, in the industry or outside for something, then when you see that they are sharing, you really get like more, I think you put them higher actually, because it's, you have to be strong to share like flaws and the failures. And so it, it shows that you are tough enough to do that if you do it. Correct. And yeah, that you don't I, really care also, always what everyone thinks. You know, we've been talking about being open to show your sailors, right? In business and in sales as well. I think pharma has this image of being like, you know, very transparent where people 
Well, and people don't really like pharma, let's face it, like, because it has this image of being infallible, whatever happens, it's inside a small mm -hmm. circle of people. Nobody knows where is it. It's like, like banking. Yeah. Banking, but more serious. I would say pharma mm -hmm. is even more serious. Yeah. So I've been to a, a conference recently and I think maybe 90% of the people were in suits at the conference, although it was. So they said like, you guys can wear anything and people were still in suits, even in summer, you know, it's so hard to handle the heat. And mm -hmm. I was thinking myself about, about the conventional part that it's interesting, but in like, in startups we have, I worked a lot with startups in the past and we have a program is event called fuck up nights when if founders come and they talk about their fuck ups, their failures. Right. And those, those mm -hmm. events were very, very popular among people. And it's really important that you can show your vulnerability, you can show that you failed and that you learned from it, especially when it comes to sales, mm. because let's talk about like pharma sales. You get a lot of no's, right? You get a lot of no's and your goal mm. as a sales leader yeah. is sort of not change your customer doubts because your customers always have doubts about like your product or let's say you try to sell them mm. like some syringes or, you know. But you, your goal is to sort of reframe his vision, right? Like when you put yourself against your competitor and what I was saying is that when you put your, yourself out there, being transparent and being vulnerable in front of your audience, it will do a mm -hmm. lot of change. It will change the way how people perceive you. It will change the way how you perceive yourself and mm -hmm. you'll be open basically when you publicly assume that publicly show that you have tried and you have failed, you know, it opens up your hands, right? We say that in Russian, untying your hands, because when your hands are untied, you can basically go and do anything and it will just help your leadership style. Yeah. Let's wait for Josephine. So for your listeners, we had a small pause related to technical difficulties. Last thing I was talking about was about the failure, the fact that in the startup world, we have these events that are called the fuck up nights where founders talk publicly about their the events that sort of change their life and, you know, their failures. And I think it, it makes you a more credible leader if you do that. Um, and I think, um, certainly pharma could benefit from having these sort of nights because, you know, it would open up and would show transparency and vulnerability and it would, it would benefit a lot of people, right? Like, especially like say, leaders in pharma, right? Josephine. I have a question here. So you said you are dealing with stakeholder alignment, stakeholder management. Is how do you how do you make sure that your stakeholders are happy and you know everyone is alive? Do you have a way how how you do it? Yes, and I love how you in the end of that question also mentioned a really important point. So that in order to make everyone happy, they need to be aligned. So it was perfectly phrased, and I would say. First of all, people communicate so differently in different countries. So you have to be mindful of that. Like for in some Nordic countries, we don't focus so much on the social part. We just, you know, do business. And for other countries, that is the social engaging part is actually much more important when it comes to building a relationship. And just a basic tip is to ensure that everyone is aligned is that you of course, meet face to face because you, as humans, we don't communicate, I would say, well at all by emails because you lose all the nuances. And especially in the beginning, when you're really building that rapport and the relationship and building the trust, you need, need to meet uh, a lot face to face. And then after meetings, it's great to, when you have decided on things, on actions or how to move forward, it's great to, you know, summarize that and then send that over to the other party to get input and comments and ensure that you are on the same page for what you want and what you need to do going forward. Can you give an example, if you, maybe from your work practice? Yes, I think, but it's also in the small things that you do that with your closest colleagues. But of course, it's more important when you are establishing connections with new partners. And for us, we have producers that you know produce our pharmaceuticals we don't mm -hmm. do that in the same company so we have other companies doing that for us as mm -hmm. for most of our product today and those are often in other countries that relationship is really important to nurture of course and working as a business unit director previously had a lot of contact with such partners and then when you're 
are launching product, for instance, then it's extra important that you have this alignment all the way. Because we at Frost Pharma, we are the bridge here for understanding the Nordic market. And that differs quite a lot for each country, actually, even in the Nordics. And it's not the same as other countries, obviously. And you need to make sure that the partners are aligned in that and what demands needs to be met when, of course, regulatory, there are much things that are alike. But for market access, then they need to know what you want or need from them in order to that we can, for instance, working with procurements and you have those contracts to follow, then they need to know what we expect from them and what we need from them, you know, to together have a successful launch, for instance. So that would be one example of the longer project working with important stakeholders, I'd say. Did you have stakeholders who are ever di- totally different mentality than yours? Like say uh, they were in India or they were in the yeah. where people first build a relationship and then they build business, right? Did you have any relationships with countries from maybe Latin or Asia? And how did you manage that? Yes, as a company we do, but unfortunately I don't have so much insight to give there because I haven't been working with Asian companies since. since. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. But let's talk yes. again in a few years. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we'll keep on, on doing this podcast for, for some time. So I'm pretty sure we'll meet again in a few years. Yeah, and, and of course, I hear a lot of things and being around, but not being responsible for those relationships. But it's more interesting to provide examples where you have been part of it, I'd say. Okay. Makes sense. Okay. So obviously you've been working with like, you are a sales leader and you worked with your sales team. And when you were a business unit manager, you also had a team. How did you make sure that you're like, how did you use data in your like sort of like sales? Sale? Because you're a scientist, I guess you have a large. You believe data a lot in facts, right? How do you use data yes. to motivate your team? How do you do that? I'm, I'm curious. Yes. So one thing we work with is the Power BI to improve, you know, visualization and storytelling of the sales data and to save time for the sales force. It's so much easier. I personally love Power BI actually, because I'm a very visual person. And uh, of course, people have different ways of taking in data, but using that application, then you you can also, of course, always still export the basic uh, or the raw material, the raw data, if you are a person who loves tables instead and Excel. But mm-hmm. for many people, it's much easier and you faster get the story if you have the graphs and you have these visual aids. So then you can very fast see how, you know, and You can also take out the data that's relevant for you and for your portfolio. So you can follow your sales and, you know, is the budget forecast and actual sales aligned and what activities provided, you know, higher sales. And that is always important so that you know with what efforts to focus on and what's worth investing in. And of course, we have also CRM systems to, I think it's really important that you as a company, if you have several people interacting with the same person, the same customer, then that you can have the same, not the exact same dialogue, of course, but that you can continue the story and the same dialogue so that it's, so that the person feels like they are known and not just anybody, I would say, because mm-hmm. it can ruin your brand if you contact someone. If someone else in the team contacts someone that's been in a lot of interaction with someone else, and then you start to like, hi, I'm from Frost Pharma. And, you know, you start to present the company that can be, that's not great for the relationship. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So that's one reason to use CRM systems. And uh, of course, the common, you know, sales data, IQVIA, you have to keep track of your market shares. Mm -hmm. And uh, So you guys are using using IQVIA on top of Power BI, like Power BI on top of IQVIA? Yes, so for Power BI, it's mostly looking at our sales that we have mm-hmm. not in relation to other sales, like not in relation to competitors, but still mm-hmm. you have to have some raw data that you put in there. And uh, so, of course, you could use Power BI as well and see market shares, but we haven't started on that yet, but that's, you can vis- visualize any data that you want. Nice. Yeah, we're, so uh, disclaimer, at Platforms, we also use Power BI for, uh, for our Sierra and our clients mm. love the Power BI function because for any sales leader, it's important to have, to have data, right? Like to, to yes. make 
unbiased, correct decisions. And especially yes. if you're in sales, like you're in sales excellence, you're in sales. You basically want to make your sales force a very efficient, right? Because they go and see doctors. Mm -hmm. They wanna, you wanna have all the statistics, right? Mm -hmm. So I think, but what I think what what's important to know is that although you do have you do have all this data, it's very important to make a decision based not only on your data but on also sort of a bit on emotions because you're dealing a lot of with sales and a lot of the sales yes. you're doing all yep. also emotional. So that mm -hmm. would be. Can you can you reflect on that? I think you're definitely correct. Some people get so stuck also in data and don't take any decisions and that's very suboptimal, uh -huh. I'd say. <laughs> so of course you're definitely right. And yes, it's a lot about gut feeling and especially in the dialogue and interaction with your customer and when you're building that relationship and that trust. And for us, it's very important to have that because we're dealing with, I mean, the, someone that's ill, you know, a sick person the end customer is the patient so you really have to build that trust with your primary customer that you're working with which is your of course key opinion leader or healthcare professional and mm -hmm. in pharma the sales force is called key account managers and mm -hmm. that's not by accident i mean it's not like going into a store and you buy something and if you don't like that person in the store you still maybe will buy what you need at least once but here you really your customer is more like an account, if you could say that, that you're really nurturing a relationship much more than, yeah. you, so it's more important what you do. <laughs> yeah. So basically, so for those who don't know, key account management is like when you are an account manager and you have a certain company that you need to take care of, right? So your goal is not only to basically work, let's say you work with, as an example, right? With an international pharmacy, right? And you work not only with the local representative, but your goal is also to sort of upsell or sort of sell to other countries which have the same pharmacy, right? We have the same pharmacy network, right? Like, let's say mm. me in, in Asia or in other countries in Europe. And in these cases, you need a lot of di diplomacy, which I think is very important mm. when you're building a relationship, right? It's very important in diplomacy. It's very important to have a good connection with these people, not mm. only online, but offline as well. We found best sales are made when in a non-conventional, non non-conformist like non environment. When you go mm. like for a drink or you go, you have some hobbies together or you go golfing, mm. you know, playing football, wherever it is, you go together, right? That's when that's you so actually true. form a bond with those people. And that's when you actually find the real reason why a, a certain product or a certain initiative is blocked, right? Let's say. Mm. We, you cannot sell to another different European country because the managers have a conflict or because they have a different agenda, right? So none, mm. none of these things you will know, you will be told on a, a sort of like meeting with ties, right? In the office. So you still, you have to dig deeper. That's why it is very important to trust data, but also trust the human factor and mm. also build, nurture the relationships. But at the same time, there is a book, it's called the challenger sales. It's about different types of salespeople. And you would think that with the people who build relationships are the most, are the most, I would say this, the most successful ones. Well, mm. you couldn't be more wrong, basically. The, the, found, the writer of the book, they made the research on more than 10,000 salespeople and their patterns. And they found out that the relationship, the people who focus only on building the relationship are the worst salespeople. Yes, you heard me right. The best salespeople are not the lonely wolves who don't care about them, who care only about themselves and the team, but the best people are those who challenge the client, which means you don't have to try to sort of like doubt that your client has a doubt, right? Because that often happens. And, Sorry, and I didn't hear what was the best sales person you said? The one it's, who... It's, it's the challenger. It's the challenger, right? So what's the goal mm. of the challenger? It's like but, someone who yeah. negotiates with a customer, right? It's like, mm -hmm. go ahead. Let's reflect on this. Yes, it's really interesting. Which, uh, was it industry specific? I just have to ask. No, it was from a lot of industries. Uh, yes, that sounds really around. interesting. Yeah, please do. It, but again, I don't see that the two needs to be mutually exclusive for building a relationship and being a challenger. Of course, looking at the, you know, you have the negotiation quadrants with them. If you're focusing on the relationship or focusing on you know, just winning that the best deal. But mm -hmm. 
but and and that's one thing I really understand that but for because then you put yourself down let's say and working with that quadrant that's the theory in uh, in order to get a you focus on the relationship and that's what's more more important to you than getting a good deal and that definitely I agree with but if like here for pharma when you're working with the relationship then it's not that it's that it's not either the relationship or the good deal and i read so that's a difference between and you depending on how you use those words um but i can really understand the part you mentioned about being the challenger and mm-hmm. in sweden i would say at least very often people are not fond of disagreeing thinking that if you if you have another input or another thought then you are in a fight let's say this is a common mm-hmm. misunderstanding and mm-hmm. so people often avoid that but mm-hmm. it's not the same i mean people should have different viewpoints and then you should have a dialogue and a discussion and it doesn't mean that you don't like this person or that you are dis- that you are in a fight and mm-hmm. so when used correctly i really understand that this part you mentioned about being the challenger so of course you have to be um, when you are in a dialogue with your customer you really have to as you say you have to understand their you know concerns or their doubts because there's always going to be concerns or doubts for something new that's just how humans are mm-hmm. and of course as you say you have to challenge that because you have to bring those things up to the surface and then you have to you know remove them the doubts mm-hmm. and you can't do that yep. unless you talk about them So yeah that sounds like a interesting book. I, I would say this. I will send you the title later. It's called The Challenger okay. Sale. Um I've met a few early business leaders who have worked for the organization. One of them is Jen Allen Clark, she's a woman and she's mm-hmm. been a relationship builder. Her style was a relationship builder. And she mm-hmm. transitioned a bit into challenger because she was like, "Oh, she was like, "Oh, look, I have to fight. Like I don't want to fight, but eventually what actually something interesting happened here." I was bringing you new information that it, which is basically giving you a challenge and then you brought us new information <laughs> we started talking about you, the culture in Sweden and that's what the challenge yourself is we're still building a relationship but we're having a small debate which hmm. you know makes sense and where because I brought new information and that's what ch- ch- challenger style sort of style is when you br- br- hmm. bring in new information into the you know, data set into your entire discussion and then you decide I'm not trying to challenge your doubts right i'm just giving you new information trying to educate you and mm. you sort of take your own decision i'm not fighting your doubts like you'll handle your own doubts right <laughs> yeah but that's really interesting and that's how you get the best and most interesting dialogue and also how you move forward i think in be it in business or just you know private life because you learn new things when you interact with people if they bring new viewpoints so it's much more interesting than just agreeing all the time Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. And I guess if you guys have a different culture as we do, it still makes sense to make it less let me provocative, but if you bring in new information showing that and like you are a scientist, right? You can bring mm. in new information into your deals and you can still build mm. a relationship. So you I still think not that I think you still can combine both of these styles, the challenger and the which is not the relationship builder. So these two come alone. You don't necessarily have to be one or the other, right? I have a question. So, do you have like a culture of innovation or experimentation in terms of like what's the sales of business in your company and how do you sort of like use or enforce that or how do you go about that? Yes, that's a great question. We I would say we do definitely in our whole company. So, it's always very important, I think, to allow the team and colleagues no freedom enough so that they have they feel secure to make mistakes that you have room to make mistakes to you know go b- go big or fail because if you're not trying new things and pl- always playing it safe then you won't you know be the leader of your segment won't be the leading company if you just try the same things that everyone else is doing or things you know work and mm-hmm. i think it's infor- important to foster that as we spoke uh, about a bit before mm-hmm. because failure is an opportunity it's a fantastic opportunity to learn and gain perspective and also stay humble and so it's important to ensure that you build that 
you know, environment where they feel that they're even, doesn't matter if you're being the manager or again, the informal leader of a project, just make sure that people in the team feel that you trust them to make the best decision, of course, with the available information at that time. And as always, you know, when you find new information, you iterate, but at least they feel that they have that trust. Mm -hmm. And also that, again, circling back to a bit what we just discussed, that people feel heard. And of course, they're not always going to get their way, but if you don't bring in the unique viewpoints, which is, again, then not a fight, it's just disagreeing and bringing new thoughts and moving forward, that gives you much more results and just direct consensus in a group or every individual thinks alike. Correct. Yes. So like, listen, not for our listeners, so whenever you guys are doing a film, don't try to change onto your, your customer's mind right away. Your goal is to plant a seed of doubt, a seed of like interest, to spark some interest, whether mm -hmm. he or she can reframe the, the problem in a different way. Einstein actually said one interesting thing. He mentioned that we cannot solve the, the problems at the same level of thinking when we created them. So basically, which means mm -hmm. you have to elevate yourself. In order mm. to uh, sell something or in order to pass through a challenge, you basically elevate yourself. So mm. you become a, a better person, a better business leader, a more, a smarter person, if you want to say so. I have a few more questions for you, actually. Mm. One of them, you, I see you're a very positive person, right? And you're <laughs> very like, you're, you're radiating a lot of like good energy. So how do you like, mm. how do you personally stay motivated and how do you maintain a positive attitude with your team? during like hard times or like when sales numbers, company num company KPIs are not the best. That, that never happened. <laughs> no, oh, okay. of course, of course, all the time. I mean, also when you set ambitious goals, then you're not always aligned and then you have to do something. So yes, thank you. That was so kindly said also, but yes, I am a very positive person. And however, I am also highly result oriented. So, of course, not getting the results I want, you know, quickly frustrates me sometimes. In pharma, taking the customer through the adoption ladder is a long sales and relationship building process, as we have discussed. Mm -hmm. But there are always ways to measure, you know, small steps on the way to mm -hmm. milestones. And until you see the sales you want, you have maybe not the most fun things to measure, but you have things <laughs> so that you can, you know, cross off your list and feel that you are achieving something like mm -hmm. actions, like number of calls or interactions. And, but the most important thing I'd say is having, you know, brilliant colleagues to discuss with, even if they haven't met your, the same, you know, I don't want to say problems, but the same opportunities that you are stumbling upon, let's say, then at least just talking with the, with other knowledgeable people, then often helps you move forward and find a new opportunity to try something new and mm. also to gain some more energy, I would say, from an inspiration from colleagues. Awesome. So, yeah, as you mentioned something interesting, trust the process, okay? It is important to trust your gut feeling or like, you know, sometimes the, you have a bad day or you have a bad sales cycle or right now, summer is not the best time for sales for most of the industries I know. And the sales numbers are going down, but it's important to trust the process and know that mm. if you have discipline and you trust the process and you continue on prospecting, you continue on ed educating your buyer, success will come, yes. right? Yes, success definitely. And you're right with the, that discipline. It helps a lot. It certainly doesn't hinder your sales process. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> awesome. Okay. So I have actually two more questions for you. So one question that I have is how do you stay up to date to like the latest, let's say sales, I don't know, tools or sales news or like, you know, like business news in your field of like study or work? Good question. I see two different paths here. And so first of all, when you're looking at things that can help you become, you know, to win your segment, to become the leader or the leading company, then I'd say you should not look at other companies within the industry to gain you know, inspiration because you, if you find someone else or even worse, everyone else is doing it, then you don't want to, then you're just a follower, right? And that will, will not make you win anything. But of course, when you're looking at something like, you know, an internal tool or internal platform that will help the 
operations run more smoothly, then of course this is not going to be, you know, distinguish you or your company from another company. So if you see something that works in that area, just adopt it. But we're looking at things that will, you know, technologies and tools that will define you as a company. And if there's a new segment you want to get into and you need looking for a tool that will help you to achieve that goal, then it's much better to, you know, in an inspirational drought, you can look at other industries mm -hmm. and see what works there and adopt that to work for your industry. And then you'll be the first, first one in your industry to trying that. Or uh, even better, of course, is just discussing with your team and having a dialogue and see like a think tank or something, just a discussion. And that often brings you the best new results. And of course, like how do you find which gaps you want to fill and which needs you want to, you know, help? Then you need to talk to your customers a lot. That's, they will know what their patients need. They will, of course, know their patients the best. And they know how they like to, you know, get information or how they would like to interact. And quite often <laughs> it's easier for them to tell you what they don't like, but that could also be inspirational to see mm -hmm. what things to avoid and then find another solution. So if you have a really great team, then you will find new things without looking in, at other companies. And I think because if you focus too much on others, then of course, again, you're not going to be the leader in that field. But also you will lose, sometimes you lose belief in your own strategies because everyone else is doing something else and then you lose mm -hmm. focus and momentum. So it's better to just focus on yourself and what you are doing and what you can do better. That makes a lot of sense. Thanks. So I have my last question for today, Josephine. And the question mm -hmm. is, if there was, there were like one or two advices that you could give future sort of like people who are just starting in sales excellence and sales and pharma, what would the advice sound like? Oh, those are the best people to get into your company, I'd say, because they're not, you know, forged and they don't already have the mindset as everyone else in the industry. So I think these people can really provide a new perspective. So the advice to give is to trust yourself and what you know that you are, you know, what areas you excel in. And try to bring that new viewpoint to the company and to your sales approach. And instead of just thinking that, oh, I'm going to learn this company so well and do what everyone else is doing, try and find, I mean, of course, they are doing a lot of things that work. The company you'll find since it's on the market, right? But mm -hmm. try and take them to the next level instead and see what with your new eyes, like what, what can be, what can be better? What can we try? and to trust that you can bring something new to the table. Okay. Awesome. Thank you so much. All right. So I don't have any more questions. Thank you so much for this episode. It was very interesting. Again, for our listeners, the book that I mentioned and the name of the book is The Challenger Sale. The author is Matthew Dixon and Brent Adamson. Yeah. Thank you so much, Josephine, for being with us on the podcast. Hopefully to, I'll see you in two years when, as you mentioned, we can well discuss the future, you know, any other skills that you've gained, many other experiences that you, you've had. And uh, thank you so much for being with us. Thank you, Stefan. It was a pleasure. And I look forward to the next time. Thank you.